Hugh C. Maguire, and I call it Answer to Connor. Hugh C. Maguire? Yeah. Hugh C. Maguire. What's your name, just as what you're going by at the Hugh's, minute? Oh, Connor Maguire. Connor Maguire. And where are you from? I was reared in Darling Street, and I'm skinning. <laughs> and what are you going to talk about now? Basically, my childhood. My childhood. Part of it. Okay. And um, when was this your childhood? When would you have classed as your childhood? From 46 on to now. You've never grew up? <laughs> never grew up. <laughs> okay. So, well, we'll go back to that. What is your name? The full name is... Yep. Hugh, Just explain that. Hugh Connor Ignatius Maguire. <laughs> Very good. Very good. <laughs> Uh, the reason being Maguire, Conor Maguire would have been a traditional Maguire name. Although when I was at school, years later, I was had been out in the railway hotel, and there was a gentleman and heard people calling me, <laughs> and he called me over, and I thought he tended to, I thought he was a, a retired policeman. <laughs> And he started asking me questions, and he says, "Are you Conor McGuire? And did you go to Abbey Street School?" Uh huh. And Abbey Street School was what we're talking uh-huh. about. Uh huh. It was. I said I did. He says, "Well, I was in the school's register for the North of Ireland." And he says, "I remember in the fifties this name popping out of me." <gasps> really? And he says, "You were the only Conor McGuire on the road books in 1955 or whatever." <laughs> wow. And he says, that's how I knew you used it. That's quite remarkable, actually. Wasn't it? I can't even remember. I can't even it? remember now. He never says, like, passing over back, you know, with that. That's a really remarkable you know, point. But now, Connor is the most popular Irish name anywhere in the world. You yeah. Know, you know, yeah. After you, what he called your man, the musician, he has a son called Connor, fell off a balcony up a multi-story building. Uh, Don't yeah. know. I think it was named uh, Eric Clapton. Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And after that, lad, <laughs> this child, was, he was called Connor. And Connor became yeah, a yeah. I, I put it down to that. You know? I well could be. There's a lot of things escalate yeah. names, so there are. So. And I lived in Dallas <coughs> in the 50s, after you born, that I was down one Christmas. You were. You burnt? People when I would tell them that the younger generation, because I, I look so stern, probably as an older person, that they couldn't believe that I would do anything like that. Bad rascal. <laughs> I was always in trouble. I was always in trouble. Yeah. If I wasn't trying to hang the dog. So, what's your earliest memories going back? First of all, at home and the house and your your parents and stuff, and then you can start and tell me about all these mischievous behaviours and I, school uh, and stuff. As I said. The house we lived in was a shop, Greengrocers. What was the name of the Greengrocers? It was called The Garden. The Garden. And escaped, the Garden Gate opened out into Head Street. Head Street, yeah. And when you went down Queen Street from our house, you turned right onto Head Street. Mm-hmm. Uh, when, at one time... <laughs> At the bottom of Darling Street, at the top of Queen Street, or Barrack Street as it used to be called, there was a Desi Murphy's shop and bar. I think it was a shop as well as a bar. And, but the house to it opened out onto the top of Queen Street. And it was opposite mm-hmm. O'Reilly's bar on mm-hmm. the far side. And O'Reilly's grocery shop. And there were three, maybe four houses there, and we, we cottages. And there was a lady there. Kathleen. I mean, I'm not sure if she was Kathleen or the daughter was Kathleen. Kathleen Hyde. And now I have vague rem- memories of her, but she took in laundry for the recruits uh-huh. in the barrack. The oh, barrack at right. the bottom of the street. Yes. Was, um, and she did the laundry for them. Was all, apparently there was always rows because it was a common yard. Colleges of the common yard, mm-hmm. and she took up all the lanes. And she was getting paid to do it too. Yeah. And not only that, during the war, she used to make candles. Mm-hmm. You know. Now, who lived next? I'm not sure. I know the Quins lived there at one time. But then, in latter years, 
where people like Higgins just moved in there, I think they came in from Manade or Gomery. Mm-hmm. But when you went down then, there was Proctor's Flats or the She Barrack. Mm-hmm. Now, there was the She Barrack, as it was called, but then there was also the Militia Barrack mm-hmm. at the bottom. Uh, yeah, yeah. The Militia. Yeah. But then they had the different families that lived there. And so, your house in Darling Street. Um, what size of a house would it have been in, in comparison to the back street houses? Or it would have been a four bedroom. With, uh, there was no bathroom. Used no bathroom either. Uh, outside toilet. Yeah. Uh, there was a cellar that used to be the kitchen, but then it's, it's, it was actually yeah. a, there was a well in it. I was going to ask you, so did you have water? Because I know the back streets only had the outside stand. At the pipe. top, uh, yeah. There was a well, but uh, at that time, at that time we had running water in mm-hmm. the house. You know, mm-hmm. uh, sort of the town got it. We have, for funny, uh, we never had gas. Right. And yet, most of the streets, they were all gas. Yes. So they were. And uh, it's town gas. When Corner Grade was built, most of the houses in Corner Grade had gas heaters or cookers. Yeah. You know. But uh, I never remember gas in our house. Mm. It was always. And I can remember the remnants of it. Old. If you had them today, you'd make a bloody fortune. Sell them the in the No, but the old lights. Yes. Wall brackets. Yes. I'm laying out in the back house. So, mm. yeah. um, so is it, you'd say there was four four bedrooms, did you say? Four bedrooms. Four bedrooms. And how many was in your family yeah. then? Seven. Seven. So you, you didn't exactly have rooms to yourselves, but just weren't no, sort of no. four or five no, rooms? Had the, now it has, if it has a, see, I'd say at one time, Roofs, the rooms in the roof. Aye. That would have been for the staff in the house. Yes. Yeah. And like, I suppose at the time when the war and that came, uh, <coughs> there was no money to do those things up. Mm-hmm. <coughs> you know, there was no sense of people. Mm-hmm. If you were sick, you were put into the, what we call the back room because it was over the kitchen by the fire. <laughs> So it was the one that happened. Very good, very good. <laughs> you know. But, uh, Whenever you were younger, um, your friends and stuff. So, who would your who would your closest friends and where would they have been? And lived? mostly Queen Street and Head Street. Uh, like when you, as I was saying, when you go down Queen Street, then you can't live. Yeah. There were Proctor's flats. They were called. There was Blakers, I think they were called. He was the uh, concierge in the cinema, mm-hmm. the Reagan. He used to wear this big long red coat and a big cap and a big gold epaulette. And I think it was Blaker or Watson. I think it was Blaker. I'm not sure now if you, what, did Watsons live there. See, people came, you see them coming from one area yeah. and you assume they all lived there. Yeah. But then there was uh, Maidens. They lived in Parker's Flats, Tracy's <coughs> and McCabe's. <laughs> And I'd have been friendly with them, you know. Jerry would have been my age. Alexis, he's dead now. He'd have been my age. George, I think George to the lead. Most of those lads went off to the army. Uh huh, uh huh. Yeah. And can you remember the games and things you sort of played and some of the stuff well, you were going to do? Well, now, uh, you couldn't imagine it happening today. We used to play in 1920. 19 and 20, you may explain. <laughs> where, was it 19 and 20 it was called? Was, somebody would have started the lamppost with the head like that and counted to 10 and came and everybody hid. Hid and seek, that was. Uh-huh. But another game we played, whereas if there was a gang, it could be 10 or 12 of us. And this was particularly on a Sunday evening. Um, someone would give out, you know, the ray, many, many, many more. Yeah. Person by this. <laughs> <laughs> if you squeeze that and go. <laughs> and you're on it. When you come to, you picked the top of Queen Street, and the divide was Head Street, mm-hmm. and across here was, I think, Brewery Lane was called, like. And then the bottom of the street was the barrack. But the, this area would have been where we would have played, the top part. Mm-hmm. And the person who was on us, the rest of them would go to the top of the street and charge. So you had to grab somebody and count to, what did you do, four, eight, six, seven, eight, nine, ten? 
یا کارت شو در حد هر بیو کچ شما دیانش یم so it's like a game of tag near like the yeah. more you catch then that, there's nothing left to catch yeah yeah and uh, <coughs> I don't know it could be quite rough at times <laughs> but that was on a, mostly on a Sunday evening when there was very little see very little traffic ever mm. come down Queen Street because when you came to the bottom of Queen Street you turned right to go to Strand Street mm-hmm. and then there was I can't remember what the name was it's been around that side of the bar but this was Strand Street and judges the cobbler for lived along here. But that was just facing into the barrack war. So any traffic came up down street. Come into town. So Sunday evenings were very quiet. Right. Uh, there was a wee lady lived about two thirds of the way down Queen Street on the right hand side, Mrs. Blakely. And she's a very religious woman, so two daughters. Oh no, 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 she was no no, she wasn't as preaching. But we used to, she, she was going to church every Sunday evening with the two books, the prayer book and the mm-hmm. head book. And she was about to sit and we used to say to her, well, Nick, have you heard from George lately? And George was her son. Uh-huh. And she said, I had one son and I called him George after George Washington. Right. Because, you know, George Washington never told a lie and my George was just like George Washington. I never saw George on <laughs> Like a, I wouldn't like to use that. So he didn't exist? I don't know. Yeah. But I knew he had two daughters now. I would have known one mm-hmm. of them quite well. Like they would have been a generation older than me. Mm-hmm. You know. But wherever George was, I don't know. Maybe it was a child she had lost and just never let go of it. I mean, I always imagine he would have gone to America or somewhere. That's very possible. Or he might have been in the army or the air force. Quite a lot of men are in the air force. Yes. So just to get my bearings right, um, you lived there in the fifties. So you and the been you, you're what age are you? Seventy six. Seventy five. So my daddy was born in forty four, and he's seventy five. I was two years older than me. He's seventy five. Seventy seven. Seventy seven. Sorry, apologies. I said only seventy five. I'd be seventy six this yeah. year. Yeah. Um. So you don't really remember the, the times of the rationing and, and or was oh, it yes. still... You see, the fact my mother had a shop, we was still rationing books. And we didn't. We got those things for games. <laughs> <laughs> but there was one that had stopped. Like, fruit was scarce. Oh, yeah. And like, uh, green grocery, and that was what my mother sold mostly, you see. Oranges were after in the Israel got set up. They were big producers of ice yeah. pan oranges. And uh, a lot of stuff would have come from Canada. Mm-hmm. And apples from America. But after the war in like Europe, it was mm-hmm. decimated. But gradually then you started getting the, well, this time of year, uh, tomatoes from Guernsey was a big thing. What about potatoes from Guernsey? Potatoes. Sackleage, bringing them in the county. <laughs> Aye, but the, the new potatoes from Guernsey, uh, always around, the, around Easter, I always associated with Easter. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, no, other than that, I wouldn't have remembered much uh, about the ration. I think mm-hmm. I, there were a lot of tin stuff. Well, one thing I do remember that was had become very popular during or at that time and then it's just stopped because was camp coffee. Yeah. It was coffee extract. Yeah, I know exactly. My mummy used to use it for flavouring and coffee Making, cake. That's what yeah. my mother used it for. And we had bottles. She would have bottles left over from yeah. there. And she was great for making coffee cake. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know if you can get it today. Or I remember one time. Oh, it's saying it. We drop and pull drop water, and I thought that oh, it was for like orange for that to dilute it. Mm-hmm. I thought this is what this was. I thought it was going to die. Rotten. Oh, for <laughs> sake. Uh, I couldn't understand why the hell this soldier in a kilt was on the bottle. <laughs> I was going on the whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but uh, no, another thing too, I remember stealing from the shop. We ran box. 
and it had all these small miniature bottles that size of liqueur. Now I didn't know what the heck the liqueur was. But I ate, it. I put one in the red and that and it was hard and that and one. Oh! I went up to the bed. That's the first part of the way today. <laughs> Alcoholic poison? <laughs> <laughs> Slipping the back the box back and say, oh, man. next thing I heard was the only best who took the Who can see them? Took the you know, because they were they were expensive, they were about three and six or something at that time for a car. I said I knocked it down and maybe there was some missing other. We poor kind of when I missed it. Oh, <laughs> I was an awful liar. <laughs> <laughs> um, your um, family life uh, was a good, you know, good. You know. Under the circumstances, I had because my father had TB. Oh, right. And he ended up in Kilides in the mm-hmm. sanatorium. And I had a handicapped sister, but then at that time there was a whole move to put the all these yeah. nurses. And like my mother was coping rightly. Yeah. You know, but it just insisted upon yeah. and why was she stopped her about was oh. we couldn't get to you know well, it must have been quite traumatic for the family I remember being with my mother <coughs> last time before she died last time before she got left in the book on T van in Anderson Nancy Bradley and he used to do our man on Saturday or Saturday and every month or whatever and we got a lift up to sea there. And I remember going in and the nurse said to the mother, Sister wishes to speak to you. And the says, Well, I'm going to. Oh, sister wishes to speak to you now. And the next thing the sister read the red right back to the mother. I don't want you upsetting your daughter because it took us a fortnight the last time you to settle her after you were here the last time. And I can remember the mother crying in tears. You know, it. She hadn't got the means to get up. So what did they mean by upsetting her? She, the fact that she was severely handicapped. Mm-hmm. Obviously, she the same stopping mother from rushing her. Mm-hmm. And obviously then, when Dowdy would have... Mm-hmm. She, she obviously has some recognition yes. of her. And then when, when the mother would leave, she'd be unsettled. And right, get you know. Separate, because like, she could have shouted quite loud, yeah. you know. So they want your mum to stop visiting altogether, basically. I'm going to yeah, I got the impression that she just wanted to sit there trying to look another. Oh. You know, and I was only a couple at the time. Yeah. Um, I, was, I was just asking my father. My father died in 1959. Mm-hmm. So we did. And then we were three years almost after. Mm-hmm. So after the, nearly shortly after that he died. Uh, she, stopped, she wasn't there. Mm-hmm. She had cancer. Oh. So what happened to the family home and the shop and everything? And Or was there well, somebody old enough to take it on? And you know, I had just started serving my time mm-hmm. to the butchery. My oldest brother was an electrician. He was finishing his time at this stage. And uh, um, just before my mother died, she sold the shop to her cousins of ours. Mm-hmm. And then after she died, we moved out. And we moved into a corner grave. The flat corner grave. And I only live a couple of doors up from where I was living then. Ah, right, right. Now, so what was it like moving? At, and what age were you when you moved? Fourteen. Fourteen. And what was it like, sort of, for the family to move? And what the, well, at this tell stage, me about it. At this stage... My sister, the sister, she had decided to go to Russia, so she went over to an after mine in Gilmore. And then my lad down below me, he was going to save my cartons. He was in the boarding school and save my cartons. And my youngest brother was sent to save my cartons, who was a big mistake. So he never had justice. He came home in the summer. That's the first year and he said he wasn't going back. So even then he got a job with Sarah's time to the pub. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But he eventually ended up going to England. 
مای دیگر کنه توش کنیم نشستم مای دیگر The aspect of life, did it change much in, re- in, in comparison to what it was like living in Darling Street? Um, people I spoke to previously would sort of mention the community aspect of it. Seemed, I don't want to lead your answer um, here, but um, just can you describe to me if there were differences and what they're like? And well, as regards to parish, there was great parish life. Yeah. So there was. And people came together. Because at that time... Uh, there was in their parish in the Catholic community they were paying for the building of the schools mm-hmm. so there was the school board buildings for yeah. them and people would have come together to raise money for mm-hmm. that like dances uh, bazaars they used to actually have during the summer they used to have a, a fancy dress parade in the town and a fun fair mm-hmm. you know for a weekend mm-hmm. And that would have been very well supported, you know. Then the, the, the dances, as I say, were very popular. What would have been your favourite part of those festivals and stuff? The, dances. the dances. Mm-hmm. Well, partly because another friend of mine who lived in Corner Bay uh, would have been originally from around Orchard Terrace. His mother would have been from just down past the town hall, in the, down Hall Street. She was part of the catering committee in the parish, and she used to see when there was dances at that time. It was always tea. Yeah. And Eddie and I, this her son, and we got together, and I asked him mother one time, but she got me a crate or two of minerals, and I pay, and we sold minerals. Mm-hmm. And she paid my mother for the minerals. And she credited us with the money we brought back. And so we sold minerals at night at the, at the dances. Yeah. So nobody came in till after 10 o'clock because the pub closed at 10. Perfect. And the band to be on the stage from 9. Mm-hmm. And that's actually where I learned to dance with the, the tea ladies. When you say learn to dance, what what sort of dance? Like? Foxtrot, okay. Watson. Okay. Jive and latter years. You know. mm-hmm. And... Uh, uh, so particularly at the and I used to go to Kaylee, what they called Kaylee in old yeah. time. Yeah. I wasn't, my father taught Irish dancing and I couldn't do Irish mm-hmm. dancing, because I was good at the other. But there was this particular lady, <laughs> she was a neighbour, and uh, she used to always go and give me the lady's choices. Uh, now the rest of my mates, they had twigged it and they didn't know what it is. I, I could have been doing the minerals downstairs and come up there and have to get a dance. And they had twigged when the lady's choice came up and then they wouldn't have me out of the hall. What's the lady's choice? So the lady who asked the gentleman to dance. Ah, so you were always upstairs at the time the ladies were asking? No, well it wasn't intentional. It just so happened that if I went up for a dance and then I was leaving, the boys wouldn't let me know because they had no lady's choice was coming up. Mm-hmm. And this lady used to always give me the lady's choice. And mm-hmm. I'm not being rude. Yeah, I'm not to use this. But... <laughs> she was... Like, I was a young lad. She was tall. Uh-huh. Quite a bosom. Uh-huh. And she used to come across the hall. Oh, 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 oh. You loved her. <laughs> you knew she was coming to check you out to get you up the dance. But I was embarrassed because, like, I only came up to the booth. <laughs> And then I was trying to keep the head up and start going in there. <laughs> brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> and then, God number it now. She, she ended up a spinster. Oh. Uh, I think she was going with a lovely temper, but the didn't approve. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how that's another story. Mm-hmm. But, <clears throat> and actually, when we got married, and I, I, I still treasured, she sent us a lovely vase, sort of Art Deco vase, mm-hmm. and it's in our house. And my wife doesn't like it, but I think it's lovely. Mm-hmm. Which may be another reason why no, you... No, 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 she wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> you know? 
No, but I, I, I learned that very early. If you could dance, you had no problem with the dance. Because most women would have danced mm -hmm. if they saw that you could dance. Mm -hmm. You know. So that was definitely one of the highlights of your 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 Oh, youth. yeah. Yeah. I enjoyed the dancing. And what other aspects of your, your younger life growing up? And um, You were saying there previously about um, you went into training in butchering. Butcher. I was a butcher, yeah. Have you a butcher all your life? or was it? I was 32 years old. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good. No, I, I Tell us a wee bit more about that. And the last time my mother died, the guy was butchering. You know. Who were you training with? And the Hardys there in Banner Street. Uh -huh. If I came in at a quarter past eight in the morning, it was start eight. I was expected to work an hour to make it up. Uh huh. Even. And it, the the shops. I mean, my experience is a butcher shop. You can't have eaten in the butcher shop. No, there's no <gasps> eating. But I learned earlier on that if you wore a good sturdy pair of boots and wrapped something around your ankles. Now the one that used to get me was uh, Monday's. The uh, we had school contracts, and the Monday morning you had to slice. We had the contracts for the central kitchen. Uh -huh. The central kitchen uh -huh. was the model school. And all the meals went out from there to yes. get all the other schools. And we used to have to slice this nearly frozen liver every feckin' Monday morning. Yeah. <laughs> and like my fingers used to be completely numb. And the worst thing that I never realised that the worst thing I did was run them under the hot tap. Frostbite, you mean? Chilblains. Chilblains, sorry, Yeah, Chilblains. You know, yeah. lucky enough, uh, it didn't happen mm -hmm. then. You know. So, uh, uh, that would have been, and, and the lesson, of course, when you're young, yes. you were thick and ignorant. And you, but my mother, God rest her life, that's the one thing she always used to tell us in the shop. You're not to lift anything heavy on yourself without help. Mm -hmm. you know, and then she, she would have taught us how to lift things, bend your knees and go down. This was before her time on that no, then? No, my mother was a liberated woman. Oh, like. very good. Oh, I remember her making comments about... Uh, the wrongs that were being done to women, you know. Yeah. And she'd have been very conservative in many ways. Yeah. But she was, oh no, I remember one time there was a celebration to do with 1916. Yes. And she said the women did as much. She was right. <laughs> and they no mention. Mm. Well, no, she, she wasn't behind the door when mm. it comes to that. Mm. Okay, she sort of was conformist in the sense that women had the place, because that's mm. the background she came up in. And she would have been, as far as her family was concerned, she would have been a bit of a renegade. Mm -hmm. You know. Because uh, my aunts, after my parents died, they would have always said, you know, you watch your company. Uh, people will judge you by the company you keep. Mm -hmm. you know. And... Uh, all these sort of messages, you know, I don't be aspiring above your station. Huh. That's the one thing that I had and didn't tolerate that mm -hmm. nonsense, you see. But that, that's, that, those things would have been said to me when you were growing up. And the older people would have said, uh, your father would be ashamed if he knew you were. And your mother would turn in her grave. Uh -huh. You know, things like that, say. But the one that's, now there's two people that I always say treated me after my parents died as an adult. And that was Brian Darcy. You know Brian Darcy? No, I don't. I know the name, but I don't father know. Father Brian Darcy. Yes. Okay. His father. Yeah. Actually. He would have met me on the street and he'd ask me how I was doing and we had the football and would have encouraged me to go to the Gaelic and that. Yes. You know, and another man <coughs> was, uh, at one time he used to be Cassidy's buses in the town. Yes. Well, Morris Cassidy would have been a good friend of my father's. And he would have, he would have kept an eye out for me. I know that for a fact mm -hmm. because he called one time to warn me about someone that he knew I was associating with. But he wasn't lecturing me. No, that would have been good to have had. Yeah. Somebody that occurred enough to yeah. tell you, but not enough to <coughs> condemn you. Oh, from, I, yeah. You know, instead of talking to said, if you knew you were with that guy, you would be. You know, and he just said to be careful because he's not a nice person. Yeah, and you would have obviously took that advice oh, because yeah, it was coming yeah. from the right place. Yeah, and one time a brother of mine, when before my mother died, <coughs> he used to shop. That's my mother. And he was one of the few that knew how to handle the hand of bananas. 
Can you explain handling a hand of bananas, please? Yes. <laughs> please do. Instead of lifting the hand of bananas and breaking them, yeah, you're supposed to cut them from the chunk stock. The hand of bananas comes down like that. Right? Yes. You're supposed to cut them. Really? Because when you do that, there you're damaging that. Uh huh. Uh huh. And he would have come in and he's just taken the pen knife out of his pocket and just cut the bananas. Well, every day's a learning day. Yeah. You know. And one day he was at the fruit stand. And he did his own. He'd, he'd put, like my mother trusted him that much, he'd have put his fruit on the scale in the shop and going along this wall there was a display cabinet for chocolates and that. And then there was this alcove. That had oranges, apples, pears, bananas, and then in the middle was a, a like a stand for the scales. Mm-hmm. And he went away at his own fruit, mm-hmm. put it into the bag, and looked on the foot was in it. And your mummy uh, never double checked the either. No, no, no. But one Wednesday afternoon, because they used to the rest of the town used to close on a half day on a Wednesday, and like there wouldn't be much doing anymore, would have told some of us to stay and mind the shop, you know, and if it was anything big call mm-hmm. and uh, like most of those people coming in like they're looking for five one bin or box of matches mm-hmm. <laughs> Paul and I were throwing this ball up and down the, the shop mm-hmm. he was down one end and I was down and then he go for it and it was in under the stand and he came out he put the hand in under the stand and he came out and just walked out <gasps> must have been, I'd say the best part of five six hundred pounds Oh. And I thought my mother had hit it there or something, you know. And he came into the emergency kitchen to my mother. <coughs> and she said, away, she said, casting. That's what that belongs to. She packed the two of us off down to Cassidy's. And they lived in Bam Street just beside. Yeah. Them, so not two doors beyond the brother, <coughs> the Hardy's butcher. And we went down and asked to see Mr. Caster and he said uh, who found it? Uh, Paul and he said, he said Paul and he said thank you very much and he took the last one up and he opened up and they had a tab open up. So how did it end up under here? He had obviously <laughs> taken the come falling out of his pocket and he took the pen knife out. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But then after that she was going to Bundorn we were told if we were at the Brooks that bus stop to stop and pick us up and not charge us. Oh, how did that connect with him then? Oh, that's how he gives those instructions to the bus driver. So he, because he was a, um, so this was the, the, the we person. Part of the reward for. Yeah, oh, I yeah. And like any time I had been honest and I would have been friendly enough with one of the sons. And the bus would have gone through Valley Shannon, stopped at O'Neill's shop, didn't go up through the town. Mm-hmm. Stopped at uh-huh. her knees at the lower part. Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, but yeah, actually, I wouldn't know it remarkably well, but yes, I do you know. See, when you come in now, there's in the body shop. Yes. There's a bypass. But if you drive on in and go left, that road that brings you down to the roundabout wasn't there. Right. Along the shore. I know where that and is. You yeah. had to go down, and just at the junction between this house and this house, facing up the, where the roundabout is yes. now, there's a shop called O'Neill's. It's yes. still O'Neill's. And we used to do fantastic with ice cream. And the bus used to stop outside of knees. And any time Henry Casty or Henry Casty would have been on, they would have bought us an ice cream. So because you were good and honest? Yeah. And I ain't seen me even going three times in the one day. There's no point going to the run having no money. <laughs> I never had money. <laughs> But then the door and you walk round the door and got the bus back. Uh, <laughs> it was worth it for the ice cream and the bus trip there. Well, they, they, they weren't honest because they used to they used to have a house and they would stay in the door, but they had a, a place in Valley in Osnaula. Yes. They would have gone to Osnaula and that, yeah. you know. Yeah. Right. So, so when you did your training for um <coughs> butcher, did you stay in the one butchers all your oh, day? No, or I, what didn't, did you I didn't even finish my time. Uh, 
I went to Drugans then, which is there were Gillenses up the town. Drugans? Drugans. James Drugans. Drugans? Spell Drugans? D-R-U-G-A-N. They would have come from Macken. And is that where you spent the rest of your, your working butchers there? I was butchers there like? nine years there. And then I, uh, he had just taken that over. And actually what happened was Darley had promised me a rise and the fact that my brother was trying to claim family allowance from yeah. me. I wanted to know how much I was going to get. And I got the raise of the ten bob, it was two pence ten cents a week, and he gave me three pounds a week, but he handed me my cards as well. Oh. And he says, uh, if you want a job, come back on Monday morning, let me know. And it was August back holiday. <laughs> <laughs> so I was written my brother to come home, he was a, he was away climbing Crow Patrick. Okay. <clears throat> and of course, when I went with him. He, of course, straight away is tackled at me, oh, you listen, you left him, why, what did you do wrong? And what? And I said, there's nothing wrong. So Thomas went down to see what happened. And I said he wouldn't come in the morning, he was lazy, when he did come in, he wouldn't work. And Thomas knew, no more than that, I may have been late there on morning, but he knew that we were brought up with a good work ethic, mm-hmm. and he knew that the laziness thing wasn't true. He just didn't want to give you a pain No. <coughs> and they wanted me to come back and then I would have been back to two pence ten uh-huh. cents a week. At the time when I started, two pence ten cents was good for anyone starting uh-huh. throughout the time. But they wanted me to do five years of that, you see. And then I uh, shaved through and wasn't long and he was looking for an improver, so I went to him. Mm-hmm. And I worked with him then. Up until the year before I got married. Mm-hmm. I got a job in this ski woman shop for a man. Forcing the troubles and then the man dying. Yeah. And the guy who was working for him shot. And it was a bad feeling around the day, but thank God then I had arrived then with her because she wasn't sticking to the deal. I hadn't got it in the paper. Yeah. But <clears throat> and I had to cut another long story short, eventually I was getting married and I had the opportunity to take over a butcher shop and everything. Very good. So I took it over and I was doing rightly in it, but then I was doing the horses and the drink. Fast women, slow horses and too much booze. <laughs> I still read the old slow horse. Uh, <laughs> 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 Were you betting on the gold cup there? <laughs> Not funny, I rarely bet now. No. I very, rarely bet. But, but funny enough, it wasn't the gambling that's did for me. It was to drink. Why? Because I, I worked out lucky enough in the gambling. Mm-hmm. But what scared me of it was after I came out of the clinic, I was doing a bet every second day. And it was a multiple bet. It was 20 pounds. Yeah. Bet. And one day I actually had... I actually was in a pub, but I wasn't drinking. Yeah. And I had uh, six horses. I had four of the winners and two non runners. So uh, one of the boys in the bar, I says, What would I have that there? He says, What's John? I said, Put £20 on. He says, On the triples alone, you should get 18000 And I says, That's sweet, so we'll get the doubles and whatever that is. But then the bookies had a limit. So if I get the limit of 3,000 for the mm-hmm. doubles, 3,000 mm-hmm. for the trebles, that's 6,000. That would have set me up. Mm-hmm. All my problems mm-hmm. wouldn't be solved because I owed a lot of tax. Mm-hmm. So I did. But it wouldn't have been also. It was a very good bit of the tax off, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I went into the bookies, I had the thing in the houses. We were looking for you. That's a very bet. And I says, uh, why, when you tell me at the time and pulled on, oh, we tried to get to you, but you were gone. Say, no, I wasn't gone today because in the West End, I was here for about 10 minutes after put the bet on. Oh, we would out after you. No, so you, nobody did. He says, it's a void bet. So they handed me back to £20. 
You've heard of Barney Corley? Go on. Uh, Barney's mother was a customer of mine. Mm-hmm. And Barney, about a week later, was in the shop. And I mentioned it to him. Right. What happened? He says to me, if you have a friend, he was quite abrupt, you know. Mm-hmm. If you have a friend who's this, they're just giving the money, he says. If you're having a chance. And I says, why is that? So he says it's a gentleman's agreement and no court in the court is ever going to rule in favour of you. Mm-hmm. He says, the first solicitor's letter you sent to him, he'd have the license that name from somebody else's name. Let's see. So then, <clears throat> I had a, after that I was going into Mahans for the delivery, and I had a sports jacket on that I hadn't on for months. And I was taking in the invoice out for them to, to put in with the meat. And these two bookies took us in the pocket. And the bookies were just across from Madden's with head at the time, and I went over and I put them within 140 quid. 240 quid. I put 20 quid on, I don't think I ever went back to see it again. I bought my son a bicycle, Stevenson's in Darren City. Mm-hmm. And I bought the wife. I was pulling up outside the two mercers and I saw a necklace in the window mm-hmm. and I bought that little necklace for 140 quid. <laughs> I hardly did it about six. Isn't that bizarre? Isn't it? But I suppose life changing moments, really. Yeah. I don't know. Like, uh, when you think about the, the younger son, she was nearly, he was born on say sober, though, so I'm sober, he's in the nearly 40. Uh-huh. So you, uh, if you don't want to talk about this, you basically had trouble with alcohol to the extent you were, you are now so recovering. recovering alcoholic, apparently yeah. recovering alcoholic, yeah. which is remarkable and a brilliant, fantastic for you mm-hmm. to be where you are now. So, uh, no, no, I think I'm still, that's just still with me. Of course it would be, and it'll never go away. No, but that's just still with me, no worries. You're, oh, sorry, I thought you said something else <laughs> but yes so you've, you've been married and stayed yeah. through hard times yeah. which is a, a credit to your yeah. natures as well I, was, I used to we were younger too and watching on a Sunday the boys going into certain clubs that had the Sunday drinking and the boys yeah. drinking on Sunday you know I was one of those guys yeah. later on you know yeah yeah and the good weather I used to see them heading off and the uh, it was the door road, to the swan road, or the sniper road, to go to Swan the Bar, Black Lane, and mm-hmm. it was Sunday. Yeah. And the boys went every Sunday. Oh, why? Oh, why? A culture that still lives in many, many nooks and crannies mm-hmm. across yeah. our country nowadays, and I'm very familiar with it because I, I know very closely where you're coming from here, yeah. so would I. Um, some places are, are more prevalent, you know, more, more it's, it's more of a it is a cultural thing. Oh, it is. Very much a cultural thing. Mm. But I think as alcohol and attitudes towards alcohol changed, it became something that was more of a, a need rather than yeah. just that social aspect of it as well. But then when you look at it, it's one of the strongest lobbies anywhere in the country. And like, it's, again, when I was young, it would have been, nobody would have got up on television and bragged about being drunk. No, you're right. And to this day, I still wouldn't like to brag about no, it. No. I never went out once to get drunk. No. I went out intending not to get drunk. Yeah. 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 It's never worked out that way. No. <laughs> and thank God I'm still here today, like, one day at a time. No. Right. I, I was a heavy smoker too, but the cigarettes wouldn't have the same effect. No, they would not. I'm around the same, 25. Fair play to you, very, very much so. Yeah. Very much so. No, because when I used to be a smoker, like I was a heavy smoker, and I couldn't believe one time a doctor said to me, Oh, you never smoke. He was checking me out. I said, What? He says, You never smoke. I said, I did. He says, Well, you wouldn't offer me a lung, he says. No, well, they say that after 10 years, your, your lungs are going to be off. Well, I was only off the cigarettes at this time, because the reason I went to him was that. Well, when you quit the cigarettes, yeah, you oh. get very phlegmy. And uh, I, he said to me, oh, you must be very athletic. 
I said, well, apart from cycling and rowing, mm. and a bit of horse riding, say, other than that, I wasn't athletic. He says it's a study. Mm. Obviously, the cycling mm. has helped. Can I ask you your age? Uh, I didn't ask I was born in 1946, December 46. 46. So I'm 75, going 76. 